Live from Earth, it's Space Radio. I'm Paul Sutter, astrophysicist at Stony Brook University and the Flat Iron Institute. And for the next half hour, your agent of the stars. We've got an exciting show for you today. We are talking about possible hints of new physics in the cosmic microwave background. Or not. You know, I'm leaning more on the or not side, but we are going to dig into that. This show lives on listener questions. We record every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern here at Spaceman Studios in New York City. So leave a voicemail to get yourself on the air. We're going to do a lot of voicemails today. I owe it to the voicemailers to actually play their questions. You can also follow along with our space cadets tuning in live from around the world, including but not limited to London, UK, Howell, New Jersey, Warsaw, Poland, Washington, D.C., Idaho Falls, Idaho, Columbus, Ohio, Go Bucks, Pell City, Alabama, Redmond, Washington, and New Zealand, and I'm sure more as the show progresses now. Wow, you can go to spaceradioshow.com for all the links, podcast version, links to all the live streams, all that stuff. There's a button there where you ask your question. It's super fun. Now, I want to talk about the news. Hershey, Pennsylvania swinging in at the last second. Check this picture out, guys. And if you're listening to the audio, too bad. You don't get to see the picture. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You don't get to see the cool picture. Uh, but I'm going to paint the picture with words. All right. And then the people who are watching the live stream are going to get a double treat because they're going to see the picture and they're going to have the picture painted for them with words. And yes, the space cadets are already asking what's what's tonight's cheese is going to be. I am not going to tell you in advance, but I will tell you it's courtesy of domscheese.com. Now, I am convinced. Now, uh, <laughs> Let me take a step back. I want to interrupt myself because that's what kind of mood I'm in tonight. When I search, like like uh, every day, every day there's a mailing list that lists all the recent papers that have been uh, published in astronomy and astrophysics. It's, it's called the archive. And, and you can subscribe. And then every day you get in your inbox, like here's the 50 papers that were, and here's the 64 papers that were uh, uh, submitted today. And I scan through those and there's all sorts of cool stories. And then it amazes me what actually ends up as a story as because it's like the least not least, it's, it's among the least interesting things end up as, as big news stories. For example, there is this news story making the rounds that there is this hints of new physics in the cosmic microwave background. What the, in, in the cosmic microwave background, for those of you who don't know, is the leftover light from the Big Bang. This is light that was emitted over 13.8 billion years ago. During a very transformative epoch in our universe, the light has hung around it used to be white hot and then it cooled way down. Now it's super chill. It's down the microwave, just like three Kelvin, three degrees above absolute zero. <sighs> There's like nothing here. Like the, the headlines are uh, hints of new physics in the cosmic microwave background. No, there's like no signal here. They're trying to measure something called the birefringence. But I can't even say that word and I'm a physicist here. I'm going to try it again by refrigerant by refrigerators by by ref you know what i'm saying it's what happens when polarized light goes through a medium and then one of the bits of the light gets one index of refraction and then the other gets a different one and then they go their separate ways and it messes up with the polarization that's what it is by refringence did i do it right that time who knows i swear i have a phd now these researchers were trying to measure this thing uh, in the cosmic microwave background because if they see it, it's a sign of potentially new physics. And so, yay. They saw it, to, but with like almost no statistical certainty whatsoever. Like a, a level of statistical uncertainty that does not even merit publication. Or I'm, I'm, I mean, I believe all things should be published, I think, I think we should publish a lot more. We should publish a lot more negative results and null results when we do, but that's a different thing. Maybe I will bring back my blue shift at the end of the show so I can talk about these kinds of things. But 
uh, yeah, it's just there's nothing here. Like there's no news stories. Like and the news stories are hilarious. Like the articles are like possible detection of ninety seven percent certain. Like it's just meaningless. There's nothing here. There's no signal. There's not even hints. There's just nothing. There's zero. They measured zero. That's what they did. They measured zero and they developed a new technique to try to measure it. They and they didn't. But then it, it got a new story. So I don't know. That's where we can talk about something happier. We can talk about something happier. If you're paying attention, I do want to share this. As we're getting here in December, uh, Jupiter and Saturn are getting close in the sky. So if you think that kind of stuff is cool when two planets like get really, really close, then December is your month. Just Jupiter and Saturn look after sunset in the southwestern sky. You'll to see two bright dots that are not twinkling because they're planets and they're weirdly close together. And then every night, all the way up to the 21st, they're getting closer and closer together. That's cool. Now, I don't want to mock it too much because that kind of cool astronomy stuff is really what gets people like into space and like fascinated with the night sky. It's also like totally me because they're like Jupiter and Saturn have not been this close in 800. It's okay. Who cares? Like, like it's just, it's just math and orbits and rotation. It's absolutely meaningless. That hasn't happened. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to be a curmudgeon because I also think solar eclipses are cool. And those happen every few years and those are rare and those are beautiful. But okay. So Jupiter and Saturn getting close doesn't personally excite me. I think that's what we've learned from this segment. Oh, that's that's what we've learned is that I am I'm a 90 year old curmudgeon in a 80 year old body. Listen, we got some voicemails. I really want to get some voicemails. Remember, you can leave a voicemail voicemail by uh, joining the conversation. You go to space for all the links. We got Jacob here. Let's listen to Jacob's question. This is Stefan in Bakersfield, California. Never mind, it's read seven. a quick article on the exoplanet LTT9779b about how the atmosphere, even though it revolves very closely to its own star. Any kind of insight on that situation? I'd love to hear about it. Okay, so I hit the wrong button. I played the wrong voicemail, but I'm going to roll with it. Uh, yes, exoplanet LTT number, 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 number that I don't remember. Liz, okay, it... it it, it's uh, apparently I've never heard of this exoplanet before you mentioned it. Thank you, Stefan. You may have made it up on the spot. I don't know. I'm assuming it's real. I'm assuming one of the space cadets or Nancy are going to dig up the link for me to tell me that it is it is indeed a real thing now. Uh, but you mentioned this planet has an atmosphere and yet it's close to a star. What's going on? Well, what's going on is I'm guessing a combination of factors. One, because like atmospheres don't like being close to the star. You like you look at Mercury. It barely has an atmosphere. It has an exosphere. You know, just this tenuous gas that like vaguely hangs around Mercury because it's got bang, but nothing better to do. It's because it's too hot. It's too hot to a star, uh, close to a star, so you can't have an atmosphere. So what's with this exoplanet with a big atmosphere being close to a star? Either this planet has a lot of mass and it's really heavy and so it can really hold on to an atmosphere even against those extreme temperatures and or it just recently got close to its star and it's getting boiled off right now this is what the case with these hot jupiter planets that we're seeing these like giant planets that are closer to their star than mercury is to our sun they have these massive atmospheres and they're really weird systems are really exotic and no one asked for it no one uh expected hot jupiters but then there they were uh these are like recent things like you for some reason you get this massive planet that migrates inward and then it's orbiting its star and then it's going to lose its atmosphere and then it won't be a hot jupiter anymore it'll be like a hot I don't know, Neptune or something, something slightly smaller than Jupiter, uh, and it won't be as cool because it doesn't have this superheated atmosphere. So I, I think this is just going to be a recent thing. If we check back in another, I don't know, 10,000 years, I don't think that planet is going to get an atmosphere. Let's, let's do another voicemail before I switch to the space cadets. Who we got? This time I swear it's Jacob. Hello, Dr. Paul Sutter. My name is Jacob from Germany. I knew it. And I have a question about the speed of light. 
So doing. here on Earth, when we measure the speed of an object, we measure the speed relative to the surface or relative to the planet, which makes perfect sense to us. Mm -hmm. But in space, how would the universe know how fast an object is moving? So what frame of reference does the universe use? Is the frame of reference always tied to an object? Or let's say there was only one object in the universe. Would the speed of that object even matter if there's no other objects to compare the relative speed to? Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Mm -hmm. That is that is a super fun question, Jacob. I really appreciate it uh, because this this gets into one of the absolute weirdest things about relativity that nobody is used to. Like Einstein proposed this, and it's based on other work. Uh, but like people started proposing this, and they were like, no, 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 no. The universe doesn't really act like that, and it turns out it does. You're asking about the speed of light. Like, how does how does the universe know what the speed of light is basically like, how are we measuring it? Cause when we measure something and everything's relative, like a race car goes by me and I can measure its speed relative to me or, or, or like an asteroid flies by the earth and we can measure the speed of the asteroid relative to the earth. Well, if there's a beam of light hanging out in space all by itself, how do we measure that the speed of the beam of light? Here's the thing. What is the reference frame that we use to measure the speed of light? Are you ready for this? All reference frames. Everybody, every observer, everywhere, through all time and all space, in all directions, in all velocities, in all accelerations, and all everythings will always measure the exact same speed of light. Doesn't matter. If you're hanging out on the earth and you go to measure the speed of light, you're going to get the same number as someone in a rocket ship going on its way to Alpha Centauri. It's a very long trip, but while they're there, they can amuse themselves with trying to measure the speed of light. They will always measure the exact same speed of light. There is a, a specialness to the speed of light. It doesn't necessarily have to be light. It can be any massless particle will go this speed. What Einstein discovered with relativity is that there is a special speed in the universe, this like universal speed that everyone can agree on, it doesn't matter how fast you're going, you will always measure the exact same speed for this special number. And then when you apply electrodynamics to that and marry that with relativity, you figure out that that special number is indeed the speed of light. And that's, that's it. Did I answer your question? Did I do a good, good enough job? I hope so. I hope so. Folks, uh, this show is brought to you by you. That's right, you patreon.com slash PM Sutter to learn how you can support the show. That's patreon.com slash PM Sutter. The P is for Paul, the M is for Matthew, and the Sutter is for Sutter. We do have a special going on for December. Look, because uh, Patreon started these like annual subscriptions where you can just pay one, one chunk of money and then you get all the benefits for a whole year and you don't even have to think about it. If you sign up for an annual $10 a month thing. I'm going to send you a free mug that says, if it's interesting, it's probably wrong. People have done this. People have done this. And I, and I've shipped it off around the world. Mm -hmm. I'm drinking from that mug right now. Not the one I'll send you. This one's mine. It has my germs on it. Uh, and, and, and I'm not going to wash it and pack it up, but I'm going to send it from a factory where it's all like freshly made and clean just for you. And if you sign up for the $25 a month, do the annual thing. I will send you an auto free free autographed copy of my book, How to Die in Space. Some people say it is their absolute favorite space book. I'm flattered by that because there's lots of jokes. It's gory in places, but not in a scary way. You could read it to your kids for a bedtime story so they have nightmares about black holes all night. Uh, it's it's great. So that's patreon.com slash pm. Sutter. Now the space cadets have been burning with non cheese related questions. Oh, and thank you, Nancy, for the link for that ultra hot Neptune. Sorry, I didn't have the web page up where you send me stuff in the back back page. Nancy Graziano, wonderful producer here for space radio who, who takes care of everything. So I just show up and talk about space. It's like Nancy is a tour de force. I almost said tour de France. <laughs> we and of course the space cadets the majority of the conversation now is now cheese uh, asking about cheese telling me uh, certain cheeses i need to try uh Toltre del Caesar. okay i i will try it's a sheep's milk 
That sounds lovely. Okay, uh, Wes Strubing on YouTube is asking, is the LIGO in space really going to be sensitive enough to detect cosmic background gravitational waves? So we got our gravitational wave detectors and they're super cool and they're detecting gravitational waves and they're having a really good time. Uh, and they're based on the ground. We got one in Washington State. We've got one in Louisiana. And then there's the Virgo one in Italy. And then there's a few more that are coming online, like one in India and one in Japan, uh, one over there. I, there's a few of them coming online over the next few years. We use these to detect gravitational waves from black holes smashing into each other, neutron stars smashing into each other, black holes smashing into neutron stars. Uh, we use that because the waves that those events emit are just the right frequency for our size of detectors that we have on earth. We want to detect other events that have longer wavelengths. In order to do that, you need a bigger detector. Like you need a bigger dish essentially for your gravitational wave detector. You need a bigger thing for to wiggle in order to detect that. So we got to go up into space. And so there is the proposed LISA, which is the laser interferometer for space applications. I forget. It's called LISA and it's a it's a gravitational wave detector in space. It's it's going to be a formation of three satellites that very, very pre precisely know where they are. Then as the gravitational waves swing by, they change their positions a little bit and then you can detect them, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of engineering involved. The thing's not going up for like 20 years because there's a lot of technology to, to lead up to that. It will detect some cool stuff if it works. It will detect uh, supermassive black holes eating stuff. It might detect like supernova going off with it, which is super cool. Will it detect gravitational waves from the early universe? We don't know because one, we don't know how sensitive Lisa will be once it's actually running. And we don't know how powerful the gravitational waves from the early universe are. If they're above a certain threshold and Lisa is sensitive enough, then we will detect it. If not, then no. There are proposals for another gravitational wave detector to succeed Lisa called the BBO, the BO, wow, they got to work on a better name, the Big Bang Observatory, which is specifically tuned to go after these gravitational waves from the early universe. Again, we don't know how strong they are. Different models, different theories predict different strengths of the gravitational waves. Alien of Soul 3 is asking what properties determine whether a neutron remnant will become a magnetar you know, magnetars are one of my most favorite things in the whole entire universe. One, because of the name. I mean, think about the names in astronomy and what a stroke of luck did magnetars get. Because we got white dwarves, red giants, comets, magnetar. Like, like it really owned it. Like, like congratulations, magnetar, for, for having an awesome name. Magnetars are highly, highly magnetized neutron stars. We think they get those super strong magnetic fields from rotating really, really, really super duper fast. And we think they rotate really, really super duper fast when they first form. So we think that when a neutron star first form, when like the supernova goes off and that's all that's left of this neutron star remnant, we think it starts as a magnetar with these hilariously strong magnetic fields that can literally dissolve you and it's a, it's fun and then eventually they slow down and they become normal neutron stars and they don't get the cool name anymore and nobody cares about them anymore so we think a magnetar is a newborn neutron star it is screaming and crying all through the night and you can't get any sleep for ten thousand years Tansu A on YouTube is asking, is it true that the Planck length or a length of string, you know, in, in that cosmic string, not just any random yarn, cannot be contracted by relative motion? So we don't understand how relativity plays at those very small scales. We don't understand if even our conceptions of time and space apply at the very tiniest scale. So we don't know what's going on down there. We don't have a theory of physics to describe it, and we certainly don't have an experiment to figure it out. 
Campbell Duncan on Twitch is asking all the material that gets flung off the sun and the solar wind and flares. Is this gravitationally bound or is it gone, gone for good? Dude, it's gone. When the uh, solar wind like streams by the earth, it is emitted from the sun. It is just gone. It's gone. Bye. It's never coming back. So just wish it good luck because it is not coming back. All right. Will the CMB ever end from our perspective? This is Viso2D over on YouTube. Cosmic microwave background. I mentioned when we talked about this non-story that is all of a sudden a big news story for nothing. And I even know one of the co-authors of the story, Ichiro Komatsu. He's a super cool guy. Like, he does cool work. And, like, he wrote a paper. And I don't, I don't know. Anyway... I, I, like I said, I'm in a mood where I'm going to interrupt myself. The Cosmic Microwave background, when it was released 13.8 billion years ago, was literally white hot. It was 10,000 degrees. As the universe expands and cools, the radiation of that Cosmic Microwave background cools with it and red shifts with it. And it's down all the way in the microwave band right now. It will continue to get colder. It will not reach absolute zero because nothing can reach absolute zero, but it will approach absolute zero. And the wavelength of the cosmic microwave background will get longer and longer and longer and longer. It eventually, like billions of years from now, it won't be the cosmic microwave background. It will be the cosmic radio background. And then the cosmic very radio background and then the cosmic super duper ultra radio background. Uh, and eventually it gets to the point where you the cosmic background will have a wavelength the width of the universe which makes it undetectable so if for all intents and purposes even though it will technically be there you can't see it and so it's basically gone and so our future 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 descendants if we don't write this stuff down about the whole big bang thing they won't they may not know what hap would have happened because there wouldn't be any evidence of it in the form of the cosmic microwave background and as Launchpad Astronomy says over on uh, the YouTube chat, it'll just be the background. That's right, the background. And then it'll just be gone, and we may not know what our universe was like in the distant past. I want to do another voicemail. Here we go. These are fun. Steve. Hi, Paul. Steve here from the UK. I have some questions about the properties of dark matter. Dark matter has clumped into threads throughout the universe. Is this clumping still in progress? Also, the Milky Way is at the center of a spherical halo of dark matter. Do the particles of dark matter orbit the Milky Way in circles, or do they boomerang back and forth through the center? Also, is the dark matter density uniform, or is it denser near the galactic center? And if so, is there any process by which this density is changing? Thanks, Paul. Okay, that was technically three questions, and I may have forgotten what the first question was by the time you got to the second question. But uh, let me tell you, for, uh, so I'll, I think I'll answer them in reverse order. Dark matter makes up 80% of the mass of the universe. All right, so far so good. It's non-luminous. It doesn't interact with light. You can't see it. It is denser in the center. So the center of the Milky Way, there is more dark matter there than there is on the outskirts, but it's much more uniform than any of the stars or gas. It's just slightly more dense. Okay. Uh, what are the particles of dark matter doing? They're like buzzing in and out. They're not really orbiting in a circle. They're more flying in and out, in and out, like doing... Um, like each one is coming from a random direction. It just like bounces back and forth. So you got one going this direction back and forth over the course of millions of years and another one going this direction, this direction, and then all together they build up what's called a halo. Now, as for this, these strings and streams of dark matter that you mentioned, this is called the cosmic web. The cosmic web, and I have a picture of it, of it up here for the space cadets. The cosmic web is in fact not being built anymore. It is in fact being disassembled as we speak. This structure, the largest pattern found in nature, this is a thing made of dark matter, made of galaxies, is being ripped apart at the seams by the accelerated expansion of the universe. This thing we call dark energy, 
It is tearing this apart right now. And it's been tearing it apart for a few billion years now. And its work will be done in about, I don't know, like 10 or 20 billion more years. Uh, but you, in the cosmic web, there are these vast empty regions called the cosmic voids, these dark patches where there's nothing. Those are filled with dark energy. They're accelerating uh, as they get bigger, and then they are going to rip apart all these filaments. And so bye-bye cosmic web. It was pretty. But uh, sorry. Whoops. That's not the pre-show countdown. This is the show I'm doing. Sorry, folks. I'm also like managing the show stream online. Anyway, I want to do some cheese. As we mourn the loss of the cosmic microwave background. Uh, I'll do some more questions, some more space cadet questions as I eat the cheese. But I want to introduce it. This cheese is brought to us by Dom's Cheese Shop. Domscheese.com, D-O-M-S cheese.com. They do ship. I really, you know, you're doing holiday holiday gatherings, holiday gifts, send them a cheese box. They do ship. Please call them or email them to get a shipment. They have they have a cheese of the month club because of or cheese box of the month, so it's there a variety. And they gave me today this wonderful, wonderful thing called the Alp Blossom. Look at this wrapping. Look at that very, very pretty label. The Alp Blossom, and I love I love their descriptions that they sent me, is now made in Germany at Hofkasserie Kraus. I didn't even attempt to pronounce that correctly. Comes at everyone's favorite flowered covered cheese. Can we just stop right there? It's a cheese covered in flowers. It's, oh wow. I'm looking forward to this. Paying tribute to the alpine environment that helps shape and flavor the milk used in production. This cheese is coated in a diverse combination of dried flower petals, herbs, and spices that grow out in the pastures surrounding the dairy. Utilizing raw, unskimmed milk, the already present floral and herbaceous notes of the cheese are further drawn out by the addition of the rind. Not just photogenic and beautiful. Well, don't get cocky here, Alp Al Blossom has deep flavors and prominently stands out on any cheese board. Here we go for the Alp Blossom. Pavel is asking, wait, what was that speculation about dark matter about? Uh, I don't know. What was it about? I got, I got this thing. It is, a very, it is a gorgeous looking cheese as you hear me open it. And as I unwrap it, wow, I see the flowers literally on the rind. Do I eat the rind? Yeah, I guess I do. Look at that. Oh, wow. It's like a milky bouquet. (laughs) It is amazing. Look at that. Straight up, flowers on the rind. Flowers on the rind. That sounds like a band name. All right, so here we go. Alp Blossom. Very pretty looking cheese. All right. It's definitely you like you smell it and it's it is like I imagine a cow like wearing a laurel wreath. I don't know. Here we go. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh my. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. There it is. Yep. So check this out. What's cool about it is you think because the smell is so floral, you think it's just going to be like, bam, I'm a flower or like, you know, like, like really, like really aggressively assault you, you know, as flowers tend to do. But no, it comes on. It's very mild, very sweet cheese, very tasty. And then the floral notes come out. And so now I've swallowed a piece of cheese. So my belly is very happy. And I'm smelling flowers. So my nose is very happy. And so like there's like this multiple sensation going up and down my body where it's like cheese is down here and then flowers are up here. And it's not confusing. You might think it's confusing, but it's not. It's actually really, really fun. So thank you so much to Dom's Cheese, D-O-M-S Cheese dot com for the Alp Blossom. Mmm. Viso 2D is asking, does time move faster in regions of expanding space? No. Infinite Monkey on YouTube is asking, is an exomoon really viable for Earth 2.0? Aren't they tidally locked, which would hinder a nice atmosphere? Oh, like, like, can we go to a moon of another planet and live there? 
And but aren't they like tidally locked to their plants and doesn't that kind of stink? I mean, it depends. Like tidal locking isn't the worst thing in the world. And if you're if you're a moon of a planet and you want to live there, your moon might be tidally locked to the planet, which means you're always gonna face have the same face facing the planet. So you're gonna orbit around the planet, and one face will always point towards the planet, just like our moon does around the earth. But that planet is orbiting around the star, so you're going to get different amounts of sunlight. Like, different parts of the moon get illuminated at different times. So, I think it's cool. I think an exomoon, I mean, we're never ever going to go to an exomoon, except maybe the outer solar system. And thank you, Nancy. Lisa is the laser interferometer space antenna. I missed that. Astro B is asking, is a magnetar made of iron? No, it's made of neutrons and a little bit of protons, just like a neutron star. Cerulio is asking, what special kinds of cheese could be made on other planets due to different gravity? I don't know, but I want to go there. <sighs> Pavel is asking, where can we read about particles of dark matter bouncing back and forth? How about my book, How to Die in Space? Also, my first book, Your Place in the Universe. I think that's the perfect place then. Unfortunately, this broadcast is almost done. Thank you for joining me on this Voyage of Space Radio. Sorry, but flower petal stuck in my throat. <sighs> Once again, I'm Paul Sutter, and this show is brought to you by you. Please go to patreon.com slash pmsutter to learn how you can contribute. And yeah, you get a free mug or a book or whatever. Or you just support science, outreach, and education because that's how you feel today. And I really do appreciate all the support I get from Patreon. Thank you, Nancy Graziano, for wrangling the Space Cadets, producing this show. You can catch the live stream every Thursday at 8 p.m. 8 p.m. Eastern. Go to spaceradioshow.com for more info and links to the live stream locations. You can also follow me on all social media channels. I'm at Paul Matt Sutter. And of course, thank you again, Space Cadets, for listening. See you next week. And remember, science is for sharing. End of transmission.